So aloha mai kako and good morning. Uh, mahalo for joining us today. Um, for those of you who are here for the first time, um, I'm Mike Gabbard, the state senator representing District 21, which includes Kapolei, Makakilo, Honokai Hale, Kalailoa, where we live, and Campbell Industrial Park, and then also portions of, of Eva. And I've been representing the area since 2006. And uh, when I was first elected to the Senate, and prior to that, I served for two years on the Honolulu City Council. And so this is my seventh year chairing the Agriculture and Environment Committee in the Senate. Our session started on January 18th, and it will end on May 4th. And so the pace is quite fast right now, I must admit, uh, as we just passed the middle point of our, of our session. And so for you first timers, we are starting at, uh, this is hybrid. So we have some folks here in person and some folks online. And uh, we start promptly at around nine and we finish promptly at around 10. So uh, today for the first half of the meeting, we're happy to have as our guest speaker in person, uh, Vice Chancellor David McDonald of UH West Oahu. Also joining him is Wendy Tatsuno, who is the government relations person for UH West Oahu. And after David finishes, uh, there'll be time for Q&A. But if we do happen to run out of time, please send me an email and we'll follow up with any questions or concerns you have, which has uh, Vice Chancellor McDonald. And then after that, I'll go over some community and legislative updates, and then we'll have some time, more time for Q&A. And also joining me is my community liaison, Jonathan Pomerantz. Uh, anytime you contact the office, you'll be talking to her first. So please, if you'll join us up front, uh, David. How come that doesn't go with the? Are you doing the slides or is Meg doing the slides? I'm projecting slides. Oh, okay, okay, okay. okay. Yeah. All right. So David McDonald uh, currently serves as Vice Chancellor for Administration at UH West Oahu. He is the university's lead administrative and financial officer, and he has oversight. Uh, for auxiliary services, business and financial services, budget, capital planning, facilities, government relations, human resources, information technology, and university planning and design. Sounds like you have your hands full. And he also works closely with other members of the uh, university's executive team and campus community to support the fulfillment of UH West Oahu's strategic action plan. Uh, prior to joining UH West Oahu, he served in multiple roles at uh, Western Oregon University, including the Associate Vice President for Strategic Initiatives and Public Affairs, Associate Provost, and Dean of Enrollment Admissions and Retention. He has also served as the Director of Enrollment Services for the Oregon University System. And at the University of California at San Diego, he was the Assistant Dean of Graduate Studies. So David, take it away. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, thank you, Senator. And I appreciate you having an audience here as well. I'm not sure which way to view for the camera. So I'm going I'm to look at the folks in the room. Uh, there you go. Thank you very much. <laughs> Outstanding. So the hybrid nature of these things, sometimes you've got to adjust a little bit. But now I have no excuse. Senator, he's on mute. It became uh... mute again. Okay. okay. Meg, can you hear me okay? I hear you now. Thank you very much. Um, so if you hear a little feedback, just me being thinking in my mind and hearing my voice echo as well as the technology. Uh, but as I was saying, one of the things that struck me as I looked at the university and its charge and its connection to the community was the really important role that it played in being a community asset, an asset that really helped the next generation of students and their families have a future that would be as fulfilling and as rewarding as possible. And certainly an opportunity for me to give back professionally uh, because I know that I would not be in this role today if not for others who had mentored me and given me the opportunity as a first-generation student, as a son of a farmer and of an immigrant, 
Um, I know I would not be here without a college degree or multiple college degrees. And those degrees would not have been possible uh, without a lot of people taking time out of their schedules to give me the support. Sometimes the kick I needed, sometimes the, the meal I needed uh, to move forward with my dreams. Uh, so this role, uh, while the vice chancellor for administration is largely a, a role that stays behind the scenes, uh, it is really, I think, a very important role because my job is to make sure that my team is doing everything we can to help the faculty, the staff, the chancellors really fulfill their role um, in a more direct provision of service to students in the community. Um, as the senator indicated, you know, there's a lot on my plate uh, from the auxiliary services, uh, campus dining, uh, facilities, you know, everything that no one thinks about until it doesn't work. Uh, that's kind of my, my, my area of responsibility, you know, making sure the lights are on, making sure the lights turn off, making sure the buildings are in good repair, making sure the grounds look great, um, all those things that we hope we do seamlessly in a way that no one notices. That's really probably the best compliment to the type of things we need to be doing. Uh, in the, the extensive time I've been on campus, I've noticed a number of things and I wanted to share those with you a little bit because I hope that there are observations you all have as community members. Uh, the first is that the university is small by design. It is big in heart though and that the focus of the faculty and of the staff and administrators is squarely around student and student success. Um, as Senator Gabbard indicated, I have been in other places before this, and uh, it's really interesting as a university matures, as it gets older, um, oftentimes it loses its, its focus on students. It starts to focus on athletics or on its research mission or on its prestige or its reputation or other things. And those are all nice things and are important things, but they're not core. Uh, universities were designed uh, initially to be a place in which education was provided, in which the next generation of leaders in the United States, you know, example, it was really around initially religious leaders. You look at Harvard Divinity School and such, but it was around preparing that next generation to be successful in those, at that time, limited roles. And it's higher ed has evolved much more encompassing roles and a much broader set of individuals that we try to serve. Uh, UH West Oahu, I think, encapsulates what the next university should look like, a university that is really centered around students delivering education in person as well as online. And we're seeing with this presentation, the online part of it works really well, uh, most times. <laughs> and it's a way in which our students really, I mean, I have a 20 year old daughter who is online as much as she is in person. And if you have family members who are of that generation, you recognize how digitally connected they are. And so one of the things I've noticed with West Oahu is that we have done a phenomenal job of meeting students where they are digitally. Um, and we have students who, quite frankly, don't want to be in a digital environment, would prefer the type of environment that we are in this room here face-to-face, person-to-person, we offer that as well. So we have the best of both worlds. Um, I think in a fairly seamless manner so that a student who wants to be um, on Maui completing their degree or just quite frankly across the street and doesn't want to come to campus, they can do so off their laptop and do so in a very effective way. But they also have faculty and, and staff on campus with whom they can interact um, and get their education. So it's the direction I think we're going. Uh, when I look at the the profile of Hawaii, and I look at how education has um, been achieved, there are some major gaps. Our emerging adults, our young adults in, our, in their 20s and 30s, really have not the same educational level as, quite frankly, our 50-year-olds. And that's a problem. I mean, as a parent, I want my children, and I have two of them, but I want them both to have more opportunities than I have had. I want them to have more knowledge and have more success. You know, I mean, that's a that's a universal parent thing. We want our kids to be better off than we are. And yet we're going to have this gap. And some of it was caused by COVID, where it just stopped everything cold. And some of it was, you know, beyond COVID, we had some generational challenges. So West Oahu is very much focused on adult learners as well as our traditional age learners. And that's a real wonderful challenge to have because they have different needs. And I've been thrilled by the, the level of engagement that I see amongst the faculty in trying to reach those students regardless of age and where they are. And so I wanna spend a few moments talking about some of the academic initiatives that are going on because 
many of us would not see them if they were not, you know, uh, shared with the community. One is that we are working with Manoa to um, have a very robust nursing program. Uh, we are looking to have 40 new students a year enter our program. And the combination of working with us on our campus and Manoa and the faculty they have there will allow us to hopefully train and graduate 40 new nurses who will be from the leeward side of the island because we know there's a major nursing shortage everywhere, but particularly on this side of the island. Those are folks who are local to us. And we, you know, the data is very clear. If you grow up in a community, you're more likely to stay in that community and live in, you know, especially if your family's there. So we want to bring a nursing program here as opposed to forcing our students to go somewhere else to get their nursing degrees. Uh, and that program is growing since so the second year. Uh, we used to have a program partnership with Hilo. Uh, that one uh, we decided was better off if we did it with Manoa, and we're very excited about that. Uh, another academic program we have is our cybersecurity, which as we're in this dual environment, we know that one of the ways that these type of experiences don't work is if the infrastructure fails to work or if someone compromises it. So we have a very strong cybersecurity team. In fact, our students, students compete in everything. And it's wonderful as part of the way in which we improve ourselves is to be a little bit competitive with ourselves and with other folks. So nationally, there are cybersecurity school teams out there. Um, and there was a major national competition. 500 colleges and universities sent their student teams to compete with each other on some mock um, scenarios that were put together by the Department of Defense and other federal agencies. The West Oahu team finished 14 out of 500. That's incredible for a school of 3,000 students to have a top 14 finish is just extraordinary. One of our students finished as one of the top 100 students out of 7,000 students participating. And this is a program that has this type of result every year they have this competition. So this wasn't a fluke, this was rather the norm for the program, um, which is really one of those programs that is here in part because the legislature has given us funding to, to start it. Um, and we're grateful for that type of support. But it's a program that has one of those, kind of like my area, no one thinks about it until there's a problem. Cybersecurity is the same thing. No one worries about it until there's a hacking issue that drops the power grid or causes your favorite um, streaming service to stop working. Uh, that's the type of work these students are work learning to do and really providing the background security to make things work. Uh, I'm thrilled that COVID is more or less in our rear view mirror. It's still part of our environment. We're gonna to have to continue to be careful about what we do, space ourselves and do the self-care that's really important. Um, we're returning to life again. Our university went, like every other university in the country, in fact, most on the planet, went remote and went online when COVID hit because we wanted to stop having people in, in the same places and spreading COVID. Um, we are now starting to come back to a post or come back to a pre-COVID life where there's a lot of activity on campus and students are coming back, faculty and staff are there. It feels much more robust than it was when I visited in the fall even. Uh, you can just see a different sense of life. And now running counter to that is our library, which we've had to close for a while to get the air conditioning working. Um, part of my crash course in working in Hawaii is that, uh, A, I knew air conditioning was important, but I didn't realize how overworked our air conditioning systems are and how often they break. So we've had to close the library. Uh, we closed it at the start of spring break. Hopefully by the uh, beginning of summer, it will be back up and operational with a brand new slash refurbished air conditioning system. So some parts we're bringing in new, other parts we're doing a lot of servicing, cleaning the ducts, vents. As you can imagine, uh, it's a very tall open space building. Uh, it's a lot harder to air condition something like that versus a, a building with 10 foot ceilings throughout. Uh, but that should be up and operational again by the beginning of summer, maybe even as early as the end of spring. And uh, we'll be moving all the services that we took out of the library back in, and it will be back and open as a community resource uh, sometime this summer at the latest. And that's moving along great. Uh, commencement. I was talking to a candidate yesterday um, who was, um, or a couple of days ago, who's um, applying for our vice chancellor for student affairs. And she mentioned that her two favorite times of the school year were orientation when our new students arrived and commencement when our graduating students celebrated with their families at completion of the degree. I couldn't agree with that more. Those are my two favorite times, no matter which university I've worked at, because the new energy is contagious. And it's really one of those special moments you get 
And the commencement is really that family moment where you get to watch a family celebrate and share that monumentous achievement that the students have had. Well, COVID interrupted commencements for all of us. And we have a bunch of students who were not able to participate in in-person commencements and have those celebrations. Um, and then we have our largest graduating class on top of that. So this year we're moving commencement off of the West Oahu campus. And we're gonna try it over in Manoa. And it'll be on uh, May 6th. We're not quite sure how it's gonna work. Uh, a much larger facility, better parking last year. Um, my understanding was parking was a slight challenge is kind of the way it was politely put to me, which tells me it was a major challenge. Um, and so it'll be a 9 a.m. ceremony at the Stan Sheriff uh, Center on the Manoa campus. Again, give, give that a try, see if it works uh, with a thought that this is about the families and the students and we want to give them the best opportunity to celebrate. If that turns out to be not the best place, We'll be at the senator's backyard the following year, uh, trying to make that work. There we go. Uh, we will continue to try to find the right fit and match for our students and their families so we can have that celebration. Uh, it truly is one of those great events. And I encourage all of you uh, either to go to the high school graduations or ours on May 6th. The senator will send you a personal invitation. Um, love to have you there. Uh, those are the important things that are going on that we really want to, you know, share with the community. The, fa the final point is that, as I mentioned, COVID has kind of gotten in a rear mirror. Um, our enrollment spring to spring, so we're on a semester system, which means we have a fall semester and a spring semester, and we compare numbers like no one's business on, on most everything. Uh, one of the comparison points is our enrollment term compared to the prior year term. So our enrollment spring of 23 was up one and a half percent over the enrollment of spring of 22. Uh, one and a half percent isn't huge, but it certainly is a movement in the right direction. And again, another sign that things are returning back to normal uh, for the university. Uh, we don't want to grow exponentially. We want to have this steady growth that is controlled, predictable, one that allows the legislature to continue to give us additional funding in a very stable way to meet our needs. Um, we know that exponential growth is rarely um, as successful as planned and deliberate growth. And so that's the direction we're going with that. Um, and so with that, Senator, I think those are my comments, uh, and I'm certainly open to questions or to hand the agenda back over to you, and I appreciate you giving me the time to uh, share with the community our, our updates. Thank you, Vice Chancellor. Uh, Meg, we okay with the sound? Seems good. Okay, so questions for the Vice Chancellor. We'll start off in person. Yes. Hi, uh, I'm a Montecillo resident, and I'm way too old to have children or grandchildren involved. But just out of curiosity, do you have any idea whether the West Side is getting its fair share of scholarship, mm -hmm. grant, funding? A lot of times I realize you're relatively new, but the West Side traditionally has felt that. They got ignored. They got less than they should have population-wise, et cetera, on funding. Yeah. You having you or maybe the senator having been here longer has a better clue on whether or not West Oahu is getting its quote fair share. So I'll start and I'll let the senator talk about all the great things he's going to do for us. No, <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh. and, and I do appreciate appreciate the question. So you know, the, the question about whether the West Side and West Oahu is getting its fair share of funding is, is really a great question. It's one I ask myself all the time because we are part of a system and this has activities on you know, most islands in Hawaii and, and there's always competition for scarce resources. Um, and I would, I would venture to say that all of us believe that uh, we're underfunded. And I think there's a, an element of truth to that. Um, but I also recognize that the funding process that the legislature goes through is one in which they can't meet all of the demand. It's impossible for them to uh, adequately fund every great opportunity or initiative that comes in front of them. Uh, so we have two challenges. One is that we are uh, competing with non-university requests for funds, whether it be K-12 or roads, um, health. Those are all really important things. And then we're competing within the system. And so West Oahu competes with the community colleges, it competes with Manoa, Hilo, um, and, and there's a challenge and the system office. 
Um, do I believe we're getting our fair share? I'm going to answer by saying I think we should be getting more. We absolutely could use more, uh, not just in scholarships, although I'm grateful that the legislature is actively looking at expanding the Hawaii Promise to include the four-year universities. And if that is funded at, at the way the House has set it up, uh, we'd receive $5 million more for our students. That would not benefit me as an administrator or any of our buildings that goes straight to our students, which is really where it needs to go. That would be huge. Uh, and that $5 million would be as a as a um, lifelong and, um, university employee, life-changing for students to have access to those kind of dollars to make college not just affordable today, but allow those students who have given up on the dream to realize that they may actually be able to afford to pursue their dream of going to college. Uh, and so that to me is huge, that $5 million. And I'm gonna put pressure on the Senator here to, to help us get that over the finish line. Uh, you know, we, our air conditioning system I mentioned with the library, our buildings, even though our campus has 12 year old buildings, this environment is not friendly to buildings. If you're a homeowner, you know that. And so our maintenance funds are an ongoing challenge, and I don't believe we get enough maintenance funds. The argument that other campuses make that they're older is true, but one of the ways in which you avoid major expenses is to do good maintenance and have good defer, you know, avoid having delays when you're fixing roof leaks or making air conditioning repairs when they're small versus big and you have to shut down entire buildings. Um, and we don't have enough funds for that. Um, now, it's probably going to be argued that no one does, but certainly I know in my case that's very true. And the final thing that I think I would look at is our staffing. We have 230 full-time employees on our campus. Um, I don't have enough security to really do the type of work we would like to do on the campus, especially once the new train station opens. And we know that's going to bring a lot of traffic out here. And that's a phenomenal opportunity. And I'm all for that. Having done my graduate work at the University of Washington, which has a phenomenal town town relationship with the university, where businesses prosper because the students and staff and faculty uh, use those businesses. And then they give back because they give a place for our students to be employed and uh, to learn and grow. Those type of environments are really important. And where we're located is really on the edge of Copulate circulation, if nothing else, because it's really residential where we're located primarily. Having some sort of um, partnership environment is really important, but it creates pressure on my university to ensure that we're providing a safe environment for all of our employees and visitors. So, so yes, uh, do we receive enough money? No. Is it fair? I haven't been here long enough to say, have we been fairly treated? But certainly, I think we could all benefit from more. And I'm grateful the center is going to step up and help us with that. <laughs> Well, the pressure's on. Absolutely. <laughs> well, is there a way to talk about it? Let's go. Double Well, let me go back, and I, I can't. Uh, obviously, it's very competitive, right? The other campuses, everyone says ours is the best. We need this money, and we're not. We're not going to function unless we can get these, and and so. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why we hear from day one when we get elected into office how important relationships are. Obviously, the relationship with the Ways and Means Committee <laughs> in the Senate and also the financial uh, Finance Committee in the House is very important because those are the guys that the legislators that have the final say on how much money goes into where. But it's also with the rest of the legislators to maintain those good relationships. I know when I got elected in 2006, well, prior to that, as I mentioned, I served on the city council and I'd already heard the the, the line about the second city, you know, and, and sometimes as I started having my community meetings when I was on the city council, some of the people who would attend, they would start laughing when I said the second city and they would say like, yeah, where's the second city? We've been, when's it going to start happening? Because we're waiting our roads and, and they started going down this long laundry list of needs out here. And I just wanted to share the story that I shared with Dave and with Wendy the other day, because a lot of folks don't realize that it was in 1966 when the legislature made the first funding, not fun, excuse me, the first, no, it was funny. It was the first appropriation, $300,000 for, for design for UH West Oahu, 1966. <laughs> 10 years later, UH West Oahu began, right? And that was basically at, did it start off at high schools and at community college, at yeah. the Leeward Community College, right? So UH West Oahu, $300,000, 1966. 
in 2008, 2008, I'm on the education committee in the Senate and I'm not at the chair. The chair at that time was Norman Sakamoto. And there's a bill in front of us for $35 million for UH West Oahu. And so I'm excited. You know, I'm already talking to constituents and say, hey, look, if we can get this bill passed. And so we're telling my, all the kids, get in there and testify. We, this is, so I'm at the hearing. It's going well. And then all of a sudden, two professors from UH Manoa walk in and they testify against the bill. And one of them brings up, oh, you know, after all, look, UH, it's a fantasy. UH West Oahu is never going to happen. Right, three hundred. Look, look, nineteen sixty-six, three hundred thousand dollars for planning it. Where, where is it? Where's that money? And then his punchline was, "This money, this thirty-five million dollars, should go to UH Manoa and help us become the number one research institution in the entire country. That's the best use of this money." So while this guy's talking, uh, the chair Sakamoto was sitting about where Dave is now. He's he's starting to look over at me like this, like. And I'm, you know, I got smoke coming out of my ears, right? <laughs> and kind of below the table, he's he's got his his hand down here, like, "Hey, Gabber, don't 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 embarrass me." <laughs> but I was, yeah. Anyway, what ended up happening was it passed, and the thirty-five million dollars that was the first funding for UH West Oahu, two thousand eight, and four years later, it opened its doors. And now, as far as I'm concerned, it is the pride and joy of our community. It is the, uh, it's just one of the foundational things that a community needs. And, and just to see the growth and to see committed people like Wendy and like Dave and Chancellor. You. There you go, Mike, right on. From Kailua too, she could have, yeah. yeah. She commuted out to UH West Oahu. Yeah, that's my uh, community liaison, Autonomy. So just to, to see the growth. And, and when you said 12 years, Dave, I just said, has it been that long? And it has been. <laughs> and so um, I also wanted to add what you, when you talked about uh, how special that those commencement exercises are, because for some reason I got, I got invited to be the keynote speaker at the 2015, I think it was commencement address. And so being a musician, I decided to compose a little song. So I played my guitar and harmonica and sang this little song, uh, which was well received. But the emotions and just the being there with the families, you know, it brought tears to my eyes. I just went around and talked story afterwards, and and just to see that that sense of accomplishment and that, and just the families coming together and lots of crying and yelling and all just kind of just just wonderful emotions it was just uh yeah very very nice but so to answer the question we'll do our best and we will continue to to do our best and so that's why when we get when uh west oahu receives accolades or whatever the accomplishments are we're i'm i make sure that it's passed on to my colleagues so they understand this is not just some nickel and dime university this is first class and we need to support it yeah. Okay. Yes. Question from the back. And please state your name. Lolita Tomeda from Hapoli High School, 30 years of uh, Hapoli resident. And um, uh, I, don't have, I, I don't think I have a question, but I have a, a lot of comments uh, about. Uh, thank you for the story about the 1966. Now I understand now um, when I, I've been hearing. Uh, when UH Back a while was in the making, I, I've heard that it's uh, 50 years in the making. And I was like, 50 years. 46 to be exact. Is one. Uh, <laughs> Almost. Years. Yeah. I only wanted 30 years. Because when I came to Hawaii in 1984, um, uh, not too long after that, I saw the sign of the hill on H1, right? <laughs> So anyways, um, I just like to um, comment on some of um, vice chancellors. Uh, um, I don't usually do notes, but I did notes because I got so excited as soon as you mentioned community asset and direct services, and then you went to core student success, you know, um, 
focusing on non athletic, um, more, more so on academics. And um, and then when you when you talk about gaps in generations, is um, I'm on that upper older generation, and I, I sometimes I feel like I can't relate to the younger generation, you know, uh, two, three decades so younger than me. And then uh, I get more excited when you talk about the digital and non-digital that you're, you're focused on both uh, worlds because uh, during the pandemic, I, I know uh, a lot of our young people um they can they can play games on the on online but they can't stand uh, educating online because it, it tough um, they tell us too boring or I felt I fall, I, I fall asleep or I rather play games rather than listen to lecture online without because they miss the the in-person interactions and everything and um yeah, and then the nursing program and everything. I have a niece that's um, looking uh, to go to the health medical field. And um, she, um, she lives in Everbeach and she likes to go to UH Reservoir, but she she felt that she doesn't have a choice but go to Manoa to, you know, now I can go home and get her on the phone and tell her, check out the ratio at the law because that's an option, you know. And then um of course um the I just wanted to throw it out there. Um and that uh if I I know you're saying that the commencement is gonna um you're gonna try Manoa, but if you plan to come back, you know let us know how we can support as far as overflow parking and all that, you know. Um, as we speak, where Papale High School is being used as an overflow, overflow parking for the parade this evening. So uh, we would like to support as much as we can our um, UH West of Wow because we know that's our students' future home. Thank you, and we'll certainly will keep you in mind, not just for parking, I think the partnership uh, <laughs> has a lot of levels of yeah. um, value and strength, and, and the high school, the middle school, the elementary schools, <laughs> they are part of the continuum in which we are the back end, but nonetheless, we yeah. have to be invested with your success, and I appreciate your investment with us. Yeah, and, and we have a tight, a tight relationship with you at the wow from, from top to the, you know, to 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 your, to, your, to your student even on um, internship and, and you know, field trips and tours and all of that. And thanks to, um, I'm not saying this because Kiran is here, but thanks to Kiran <laughs> for <laughs> all the time trying to, you know, help us uh, get our students to your campus and all that in terms of uh, tours, in terms of, uh, fairs and all kinds of stuff, um, her creative, creative creativity is just, you know, like, and just, thanks, Kieran, sorry. <laughs> and speaking of Kieran, <laughs> Kieran Polk has her hand up and online, and we have Kieran Polk, uh, head of the Papale Chamber of Commerce. Kieran. Thank you, Senator, and thank you, Lolita. I'm sorry I can't be there in person. There's a lot going on today in Kapolei. I have a, a full calendar, so, um, but I just wanted to just really, I know um, we're limited on time. I just want to add a quick comments, Dave. Um, I know we've only briefly met. I've worked with um, with uh, Lynn for many, many years, and, and I just have to say that your facilities are amazing. But I also know just the job you have in front of you and what you what you're doing and and I applaud you and um, any way that the couple of chamber can so continue to support you let me know um, I do want to comment on one thing and, and I just encourage us you talked about safety and one issue that we have throughout the region is the growth the increasing um, incidences of homelessness and the crimes surrounding the, those instances and the issues. So I, I applaud you for keeping your eyes on that. Um, and especially at just as the development goes up, that will obviously help. 
but in this time too, just to keep um, advocating for that. And if there's anything I can do on my side to let me know, but um, yeah, I, I, I may, for those of you who don't know, I mean, I have um, multiple events for the chamber and the community um, on the campus, including I had a hi hiring fair for nine years there. And uh, we actually, what Lolita mentioned, have a, a student career expo on the great lawn of the campus. And we have thousands of students that um, first time ninth graders on their uh, chance to see a campus and, and they come on. So um, luncheons we have and panel events. And so I know you have a huge, huge job, but thank you for uh, joining us in our community and, and taking care of our beautiful campus. Thank you. Any other questions online? Oh, Joe, you got your hand up. Yeah, if I if I may, I, I'm just curious. Uh, how does uh, UH uh, uh, West compare to the Manoa campus relative to uh, student resident population? And and uh, 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 part two would be projecting 10, 20 years down the line, if that's possible. How will uh, uh, UH uh, West compare overall in size and in student population to the current campus at Manoa? Thank you. Um, can you hear me through the second microphone? So in terms of residence halls, we have zero. So it's a zero to a very big number uh, for Manoa. Uh, we have zero residence halls. And I think it's one of the, the challenges to the campus in terms of a, a campus life experience for our students and for the community. Um, it's also one of the challenges for students trying to figure out how to navigate the logistics of being at West Oahu if they live on the North Shore, or live on one of the neighbor islands, or even live on the uh, other side of Honolulu, because that drive on the H1 um, is challenging. <laughs> and we know the train in its first iteration will only go to Aloha Stadium, so uh, certainly that'll help the folks in you know, Pearl City uh, westward, but there's a lot of folks on the other side as well. Uh, so it, it's zero to some big number in terms of housing. Um, you know, we're aware of the need for housing, affordable housing, not just for students, but for staff and faculty. And I've had a couple conversations with colleagues of Senator Gabbard in terms of, can we do something collaboratively around teachers and nurses needing housing because they're coming into these really critical professions with debt and at least in the teacher's case, incredibly moderate, if not uh, embarrassingly low salaries for what we're asking them to do from a social good. Um, and so if we really want to make an investment in our uh, the future of our kids, that future begins in buildings like this. And it begins with the teachers who serve as, as those mentors and uh, really critical adults in those kids' lives. So we need to make sure we're doing something comprehensively uh, about that. And, I, and I'm, it's a conversation I'm eager to have to see what we can do as a partner with the community uh, to address that. In terms of an enrollment growth, um, I gave up a long time ago trying to make any money on my ability to project an enrollment growth on any university campus. Uh, and I think it's even more so post-pandemic. Uh, the pandemic changed everything about how we educate students and what they expect from their educational experiences. Um, if you read 10 quote unquote experts on higher ed growth, you'll get 25 opinions, none of which align. Uh, because, you know, are we going to do everything online? No, but what percentage is going to be online versus in person? Are we going to have residence halls that are like the ones I had, which I had a roommate in a space really small enough that he sneezed, I got a cold. Um, it was one of those really tight spaces. Well, most of our students are, are now growing up where they don't want to have a roommate. And they didn't have to share a room with a sibling growing up, or if they did, they hated every moment of it. Uh, and so we have, you know, different needs from our students. And from a health perspective, having more space per student makes a lot of sense as we understand the increased transmittability of diseases and the fact that we're in a global environment where something happens in Russia, you know, it's quickly impacting places like Kapole or um, wherever you pick the point because it's just the interconnectedness. So things are changing. Uh, Lifelong education. There's a sign in here that, you know, somewhere about uh, learning to, or I think it's basically says, if you're not willing to learn, no one can help you. Well, there's an, a corollary to that is if you stop learning, your career and your life is also going to slow down because we have to be lifelong learners. How many of us thought five years ago we'd be using Zoom 
to have these community meetings. None of us, none of us. And if, if, if we did think that, we thought, oh man, these things would be abject failures. No one would like it. And it now it's a daily thing. I mean, we all do Zoom. You do it in the Capitol. I mean, it's part of our lives. So we have to continue to learn and evolve and education is a cornerstone to that ability. So our enrollment is going to look different. It's going to be more adult in terms of attendees. It's gonna be more um, part-time. It's going to be more concurrent with careers and with family obligations. So we've got to change how we teach, what we teach, where we teach, when we teach. Uh, and that's going to affect our enrollment. What's it look like? What are our numbers going to be? Uh, those are all things that were really on the crest of that wave. And none of us are quite sure from a planning perspective what that's going to mean five years from now. Uh, what I have told my folks is that we're going to continue to be a learning institution. We're going to be adaptive. We're going to make decisions that are based on the most readily available facts that are there. Um, and we're going to have partners. So we're going to have the legislature, we're going to have the chamber of commerce involved in our conversations so that we can be moving in the right direction. Our K-12 partners, our health care providers, the type of health care provision that they're going to need 10 years from now is probably different than what it is today. But I don't know what that looks like. And so those are the conversations we have to have to make informed, thoughtful decisions. Are we going to be bigger than we are now? Yes. But in what way? I don't know. That's Joe. Um, I, I can't give you a, a more concrete answer than that. I apologize. And just going on what you said, said Dave, about uh, the Zoom meetings, the hybrid meetings that we're having now, the impact that it's had at the legislature has been huge. Just think about this now. One of the things, the criticisms that we hear from many of the neighbor islanders, neighbor islanders are, oh, you guys, are, you live on Oahu. It, you know, it's, you're so Oahu centric. You never think of us. Think about this. Important bills come up that affect the neighbor islands. In order for them to testify, they have to fly over here, right? Rental car. If they don't have family, they've got to stay at a hotel or whatever. The expense in order to engage in the democratic process. Now, our hearings are hybrid. You can testify online. You can get your, and it's just, it just makes it so much more uh, democratic <laughs> where people get to get involved instead of just, you know, calling names at their legislators and saying, you know, they're all corrupt and all the, you know, all the criticisms that we receive. It gives them that opportunity to engage in the process. And it's so important. So, yeah. Yeah. Thank you for bringing that up. I'm 28, so I'm a young person. I told my friends that they could testify on things via Zoom. Their minds were blown. They had no idea. I mean, you know, that stuff is adapting in a way that is the younger, you know, yeah. friendly to the younger yeah. generation. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I have one last question that maybe you can't. can't hear the question. For for has heart. Anybody contacted you about how you're going to divide up the parking spaces and how they're going to charge how much for parking per day or any of that? The security involved. Probably nobody really concretely, <laughs> even though it's coming up in July, supposedly. I doubt the city really hasn't coordinated much with you on the subject, right? So, I'll let him mute first. I've been impressed by the, and a, a bit overwhelmed by the number of meetings that we are having that are, are train centric, if not train driven. Well, there's a pun in there, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> you know, I'm on probably two separate meetings a month with my director of planning, our chancellor is on a separate meeting. Um, and the last meeting we had actually parking did come up, not to the details of what you've asked, but there is a parking lot directly across from the second station, you know, second end station that connects to our campus. That is a parking lot that was built um, by the transit district for the train station. 
Uh, there is also land on the other side of the parkway, so on the uh, town side of the parkway, that is right now a vacant lot, is grass and weeds, that is also designated to be parking down the road. Um, I couldn't tell you how far down the road that is in order of the size, but certainly they have the space for both. Um, and so there is parking. They will have cameras in the parking lot. They, I talked, actually asked a question about security in my last meeting with them. Uh, and so they will actually have the cameras, the uh, closed circuit cameras there, as well as a person in the station monitoring that who can physically be down there. Uh, that parking lot will be Hart's or when it goes to the um, Transportation com um, Commission's responsibility to monitor, to maintain and secure. And then we will have basically the campus border towards campus doing that, but we will work collaboratively. If there is an incident that requires our folks to be involved, they will call us and let us know and we will um, proceed as, as we can. Um, it will be a work in progress like all of this. There is no question about it that uh, we will learn as we move forward in terms of having that facility used. Uh, we will learn what works really well at West Oahu that might be able to be used at the Leeward Station um, and, and continue to grow in that manner. Uh, I am concerned about the security. I think we have a responsibility as a public university uh, with a large amount of land to be really good stewards of that land and to provide the safest environment for everybody connected. So uh, I am worried about that, but I'm not scared of it. I think that we will have to make adjustments and we will, um, if we need to go to the legislature for additional FTE for security, we'll do that. Uh, whether or not we get it will be up to our ability to be persuasive mm -hmm. and the center's ability to be persuasive with us. Uh, but, you know, it'll be a partnership we go with. The chamber will ask Karen to help us and um, others to really put the right elements in place. We want this to work well. I think that the train is phenomenal. I'm excited about it. I think it's going to open doors. It will it relieve a lot of the H1 traffic that I look at and go, oh, my God, uh, this, this is what it's like, like in California. No, thank you. Um, uh, I know it's been a two decade uh, plus challenge. If you think it's taken a while for West Oahu to get here, just think about the trains too, right? <laughs> uh, but I'm excited and I look forward to it. And as your neighbor, as you know, your part in the community, if you're seeing issues with it, let me know. Uh, and we will, you know, have a conversation and see what we can do. Uh, but I want to make sure that this is a value added to us, not a, a challenge or a problem. So you have no idea what they're, what they're going to be charging for parking? I don't. No, I don't. I do know that the charge for the train itself is basically contained within your bus pass. So it's not another charge on top of that. So if you have a bus pass, whatever limitations are on that bus pass can now be applied to the train. But parking, I don't know that they're going to charge parking. They might. But I don't know what it is. I It won't come to me. I know that. Yeah. We'll look into it and get back to you and see what the what their answers. Yeah, Lou. Yeah, I, I just want to add a comment. Uh, I'm hoping that um, this parking uh, park and ride is already um, taken in place uh, during the planning because um, I had the opportunity to be attending those pre planning uh, meetings um, and one of the question that was asked to me is what will make me ride the train and I told them it would be a park and ride and I don't want to park at UH like a just to ride the train because I live in the villages of Kapolei and I'm 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 not about to catch the bus from where I am to catch the train. So uh, park and ride was uh, was one of the um deal breaker for me if you will and so i'm hoping that i made i made a, a um, loud noise or a, a, my voice was heard among other other people so i'm, I'm hoping that's already in place as far as parking ride and you know uh, and like you said we don't know if they're going to charge for parking or not but i'm hoping that you know that's um they wouldn't because that's also gonna discourage me from parking there if I get a free, a free parking from the passenger or something or my, or come on. <laughs> Yes, Kieran, you want to add something? Yeah, I wanted to add something to it. There is a parking ride, from my understanding, that's planned across the street. 
in Ho'opili, like dire almost directly off um, from the station. And so I don't know, I mean, I don't know if there's anything ad added to that, but I know on that side of um, Kualika'i, there's a parking ride that's planned. Um, so just FYI. Okay, thank you. All right, yes, question then. Is there a, uh, Sandra Jamara, is there a ETA on the start of the nursing program or has it already started? It has already started. Uh, the first cohort uh, is actually enrolled as freshmen this year. Uh, and we're looking at another cohort of 40 for the nursing program. And what I didn't say in the comments was that it's entirely going to be served in West Oahu. So even though it's in partnership with Manoa, all the coursework and the clinical residency that they do near the end of their program will be here in the Leeward area. So that, you know, a student who lives in Eva or lives in Kapolei won't have to deal with the traffic or any of those things to go to Manoa. They can stay here uh, through their entire four years. Awesome. Yeah, it's a phenomenal experience. I'm excited. Mark? Yeah, just a quick one on, um, now I've actually learned a lot really about your issues and plans and all that. Um, is there, do you have a communication process in place to the public about all the things going on? I mean, maybe I just missed it, but like a newsletter or update or yeah that's a i mean that's the number one challenge not number one but one of the top 10 challenges that every university has with its communities how often when how where to communicate um and i say there's always room for improvement we do have a digital newsletter i don't know what the distribution of that is i got it automatically because i have a uh um email so i didn't have to think about it but uh, certainly that's one of the questions I'll take down is how do we share that newsletter uh, yeah. with the community? Because there's great information in there. That's a great question. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. okay. So I want to thank you, Vice Chancellor, for your time this morning. And yeah. Very good. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Mahal. <laughs>
third, yeah, they're looking at a May grand opening. So just um, keep in touch with our office and we'll we'll stay on top of that. And as Lita mentioned, today is the Prince Cujillo Parade. And that begins at five o'clock at Kapolehale. It'll be going down Kapole Parkway and it'll end up at uh, Kamakanali'i Shopping Center. And you also mentioned, well, someone mentioned that uh, the latest we're hearing as far as the train is July. Uh, so stay tuned on that one. And then as far as, uh, I'll just wrap it up with the legislative update. Uh, here's where we are. The first crossover, that's where all the bills in the Senate exchange with the House, their House bills come over, ours go over to them. Uh, that just happened on March 9th. And now um, of the 3,132 bills that were introduced, 665 are still alive. Uh, as far as alive and well, I don't know if I would go that far, but uh, they're still alive. <laughs> Some are gasping for breath. Um, <clears throat> So our first deadline in the Senate for hearing all of the House bills that crossed over was yesterday. And then the final deadline for to hear all the House bills, that'll be the crossover is April 5th. And then all the final bill, all the bills have passed out of their final committee. Um, that uh, will be processed for the third and final reading that has that occurs on April 11th. And then the ones that pass third reading, they'll go back to the original chamber of the House and the, the, the Senate bills will come back to the Senate. And then um, each chamber then has an opportunity to agree or disagree with the changes that were made in, in, by their counterparts. And in most cases, <clears throat> they disagree. <laughs> and so that leads up to what's called conference committee, uh, AKA Kabuki theater. And the reason why it's called Kabuki theater is because nothing is as it seems. And I'll just explain that it's, you know, bills that can just have sail through the whole process that can come to conference. And then it gets, sometimes it gets personal. I can remember many years ago, a bill that I thought was just gonna sail through. And I was the chair of the, on the Senate side of that particular bill. And there was the house chair, uh, he hit the gavel and asked for a brief recess. We walked out into the hallway and he said, Gabbard, you remember that bill you killed him on four years ago, HB whatever? <laughs> and I said, no. no. And he said, it's payback time. This, this bill is dead. Oh. We walk, wow. walk back, get gaveled back in, took the vote, the vote, House will defer the bill, it's dead. Now, some may think that's like third grade, maybe fourth grade, <laughs> but that's just to, just to give you an idea of why I said at the very beginning, relationships are so important. We're not always going to agree on everything. We know that you're in politics, but at least be respectful and at least try to do your best to serve your community. That's to me, that's what it's all about. So that's what happens the last two weeks of April is, is a conference committee. And then if uh, once we reach agreement, it'll go back to each chamber for a final vote. And then it goes to the governor's desk. And he has three choices. He can either sign the bill into law Number one. Number two, if he does nothing, it becomes law automatically. And number three is he can veto the bill. And if he vetoes the bill, then we, the Senate and the House, we can override his veto with a two thirds vote in each chamber. Um, and that basically is the process. So as far as um, next month, be, uh, we will not be having a community meeting next month because of the intensity of what's going to be happening the final two weeks of session, uh, conference, et cetera. But we will have our next meeting. And I think we'll have it here. Uh, yeah, we like the the new digs nice. and no reflection on the Copley High School. <laughs> but <we're, laughs> but um, yeah, so we'll let you know when our, our next meeting is. Uh, mahalo for coming. And again, thank you to the Vice Chancellor for his presentation. Yes, Lita. I know we're running out of time, but I just want to show the ABC. It, it's not, it's gonna put me on a secret night tonight if I don't sure. out there. But um, it just came up to mind when you talk about the DR hotel uh, development and everything. Where are we on improving Farrington Highway between Waipahu and Kapore? That's been in the top in the discussion. 
from day one when yes. we were building you in Beth Oahu. Yes. And then we started talking about the rail. And now rail is coming up in July. Yes. And, you know, housing are popping up all over. Uh, but I haven't seen and I haven't heard anything about improvements or widening at yep. most. I'll have to yeah. I'll have to check and get the latest update. Um, okay. okay, and then get back to you. I don't have the latest figures on that, but uh, even it's back in the days, um, students wanted to buy from villages of couple at the UH as well, but there's no room. There's no pedestrian room or bike bike lane or whatnot, and it's it's just kind of concerning yeah. every time I drive yeah. that that stretch. I'll check with them and get back to you. you. All right. So again, mahalo for attending and uh, we'll see you soon. And thanks to everyone online. Bye, Kieran. Bye, Joe. Bye. Aloha. Thank you. Aloha.